Good morning and welcome to this week's Grow, where we gather to recharge, organize, and work here as members of MWIG. We are glad to be back as we've taken some breaks uh, due to the MWIG conference, and we are ready to kick off April uh, with Christy Carter-Bake, who works in our Caring for Creation, um, part of our advocacy work here at MWIG. So we are going to be discussing, Christy's going to be discussing um, some updates of what some of our chapters have been working on as far as um, environmental uh, advocacy efforts with some state agencies that we've been working with and meeting with, and also some activities or events that um, any MWAC members can participate in as they are starting to celebrate Earth Day or Earth Month and maybe to start some uh, good habits of caring for creation. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Christy as we get started. Thanks, Rachel. Um, it's been a minute since I've had the opportunity to come do a grow, and we've done a lot of things um, since then. And I think it's, um, I'm so excited to come kind of talk about some of the stuff we do because we have been so busy um, in the caring for creation branch, but I think a lot of our members don't see all of that because it's very, very chapter based. So um, I'm really excited to come just like update everyone on what some of our chapters have been working on for the last few months. Um, our first big piece of exciting news, which I think a lot of you probably saw um, in the discussion group or in the news or otherwise, is that um, a couple of weeks ago in um, Nevada, President Biden designated um, a pretty good chunk of land down there in Southern um, Nevada in Clark County um, as the Avikwa May National Monument. And that is a designation that our um, Nevada chapter has been working on for a couple of years, um, a long time really. Um, they've been going to coalition meetings, we've been doing social media support, we've been writing letters and showing up at um, a bunch of different um, local government entities to show support for the monument. Um, and like I said, this, this has gone on for a lot of months. And uh, it's really great because I don't think a lot of people understand how much work and advocacy and um, coalition building and like grassroots support building um, something like this takes. And it was really initiated by um, a lot of the um, indigenous peoples down there in Southern Nevada who have a very special re relationship with this land. Um, the Fort Mojave Indian tribe considers it the site of their creation story and a number of other tribes consider it a sacred location. And so it was kind of their, um, their idea to kind of get this moving as a national monument um, and as part of um, President Biden's uh, America the Beautiful campaign to preserve 30% um, of our wilderness areas by 2030. So we joined that coalition. There were a number of other groups who were also members and it was very much a like go to a city council meeting in the area and talk with them and see what their concerns are and see if they're on board. Um, Almost all the city councils and surrounding areas passed resolutions in support of Avikwame, and then also the Clark County Council ultimately um, submitted a resolution in support of the monument, and um, this has just been a really beautiful work of advocacy, start to finish, um, such a great experience to be a part of, and um, Paulette Henriad there in our Nevada chapter kind of uh, took the lead and was um, just so consistent about showing up to these um, meetings and these actions and tabling and things like that. And so it was so rewarding. And we were <laughs> like, we were both like in tears the day that the President Biden finally designated um, the equipment as a national monument a couple of weeks ago. And then I was so lucky. We had already planned a trip to um, Las Vegas for spring break that weekend. And so the weekend after it was designated, I got to go see it. And it is such a special piece of land. Um, it also is a really great. Um, wildlife corridor that it now connects um, public lands in um, Arizona and California. So that there's a really good um, protected wildlife corridor area there. Um, and we were just the whole 
the whole experience was so beautiful and so rewarding. Um, and if any of you are ever in Southern Nevada, I just really recommend going to see this um, really great area. It's beautiful desert landscape. It's got a lot of beautiful rock art. Um, and we were just so excited and so honored to be part of that whole process. Um, and then another exciting thing that just happened this week in Southern Nevada is Clark County, which is the governing body for most of Southern Nevada. Um, they just adopted unanimously their all in climate plan. And that is a plan that's been in the works again for a lot of months, um, a year probably we've been um, working on it. And uh, Clark County did a really nice job of holding public input sessions. They had a really transparent process. They had a draft plan up. People could comment on it. There were a a number of different uh, meetings where people could show up and voice their opinions. Um, we gave a lot of input on that um, on that plan. We had members of our chapter showing up to Clark County Council meetings and giving their opinions on it. Um, and so that was a really great process to be a part of and to see how um, a lot of movement can be made at the local government level. And I think that's something people don't pay a lot of attention to. Um, but there's so much opportunity there to voice your opinion and to give feedback and to you know present ideas that they might not have thought of. Um, so the Clark County All In Plan was again approved just this last week, a couple of days ago, um, and so we were really excited about that. I know um, Paulette and her team has also worked really hard um, on that plan there in Clark County. So um, some really big stuff in Nevada this year that we're already that we're really excited about. Um, the other chapter I wanted to update um, everyone on is Arizona, which is where we do a lot of caring for creation work. And Rachel, you're there in Arizona. So I know that you're at least a little bit in the loop on some of these things. Um, but for those who aren't as familiar, um, in Arizona, they have what's actually a constitutional administrative agency um, called the Arizona Corporation Commission. And that body regulates um, a lot of the utilities in the state. So we've been specifically interested in energy policy there in Arizona, and we've worked really hard to develop a relationship with the commissioners at the Arizona Corporation Commission, including the new ones who were just elected last fall and just took office um, in January. And um, that has been such a really great like bridge building experience where, um, you know, they have been so good to meet with us and um, to hear our concerns. And we're not always on the same page. We don't always have the same policy priorities, but we have worked um, really hard and um, and they have to, to their credit, to have a really good dialogue about these things and be able to um, voice how we're feeling about things and get feedback both ways. And, um, and our team in Arizona has worked really hard to um, develop a really good reputation as really careful thinkers, really careful writers, really civil people who show up and instead of, you know, screaming or being, you know, unprofessional, <laughs> maybe, um, they're always like, you guys are so civil, you're so good to work with, even if we don't agree with you, we're always, um, you're, you're always there saying you know rational things in a rational way and um so i am really proud of our arizona team for really developing that reputation and those relationships with the arizona corporation commission um and in i believe it was january it might have been february our arizona chapter leads um published a an op-ed um talking about how difficult it was to participate in the open meeting process at the Arizona Corporation Commission. And the ACC's um, job is to have these public um, open meetings where people can come voice their concerns on specific agenda items. So um, we have shown up to those meetings a number of times to talk about various um, dockets that they have open. Um, and sometimes the process has been a little bit frustrating for us because um, we'll wait on hold, for example, on the telephone for five hours to give a three minute <laughs> oral comment, right? Um, so we, uh, you know, we want to be involved in the process and we want to make sure other people can be involved in the process because if you have a full time job, you can't really sit there on hold for five hours um, 
just to give a three minute comment like that. <laughs> or if you're a caretaker and you have other, you know, other obligations. Um, and poor uh, Christy, who, Christy Black in Arizona there, who, um, who was one of the co-authors of the op-ed, um, she had an experience where she was on hold and had to go pick up her kid who was sick um, and like lost reception and like had to call back. And then it turned out they were going to recess anyway. So she, it turned out would have been fine, you know, to just go pick up her kid, but she didn't know. And it was, so it was just kind of a frustrating experience. Um, and so uh, we published the op-ed, immediately had a response from the commissioners there at the ACC. Um, we've, we've met with several of them since then. They are um, definitely open to improving the process and thinking of ways to do that. We've, you know, given a bunch of ideas to them and they've um, been responsive to that. And so um, it's it's been a really great um, process of developing the relationships there. Um, and then also, you know, that doesn't mean that you don't ever, you know, criticize if it's constructive and you have ideas. Um, and so we're hoping that we can see some improvements to the open meeting process that will allow more people to participate there. Um, and that means more people can voice their opinions about energy sources or energy prices or thing, you know, or water. There's a, there's a lot of things that the Corporation Commission deals with. Um, so hopefully that can open doors to more people being able to participate when they would like to. Um, so that was a great, um, I don't want to say like victory. It wasn't like, a win, it was a, it was a win for us to, um, to be able to further our relationship, um, working with people who, you know, are public servants and wanting to do the right thing and maybe just needed like a push or some extra ideas. Um, and then uh, some other things we've been doing in Arizona is just responding to some of the things that the legislature has done. Um, a few bills that we liked, a few that we had real concerns about, um, working with the RTS system, which is Arizona's, um, it's like an online response system to the legislature. It's really cool. I haven't really seen a program like it in um, any of the other states I've worked in. Um, but then also um, contacting committee members and doing um, sort of the traditional legislature advocacy work that people would be more familiar with. So um, that's just a quick update on two of our chapters and some of the big things that they've been doing this year. Um, and so I'm gonna switch over to um, our Earth Day events um, because we have some <laughs> really great stuff coming up this month. We always work so hard um, my creation here team and I to get stuff up, um, great material for Earth Month so that um, people can engage in this time where it really feels natural, right, to do that. The Earth is warming up. It's a season of rebirth. Um, so it's a great time to, to turn our attention to um, creation care. Um, so the first thing I want to flag is that I have been working a lot with um, some other groups. We call ourselves the Creation Care Coalition. Um, we are all um, Latter-day Saint groups um, focused on the environment. So that includes um, Mormon Environmental Stewardship Alliance, or MESA, um, the Citizens Climate Lobby LDS Action Team, and then also LDS Earth Stewardship. Um, the four of us are sponsoring an event on April 15th. Um, I will be putting a post up in the Facebook discussion group um, just as soon as we're done with this call with all the details on that, how to register. But it's going to be um, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, April 15th, um, in-person event in Salt Lake City at the beautiful Dome Chapel. If any of you are, haven't been there, you should go. It's really cool. It's this really cool old church. Um, and then we will also be broadcasting it online through Zoom as well um, for anyone who's not in the Salt Lake area who would like to, um, to attend. Um, but we're really excited this year we have Darren Perry, who um, is a, was the former chairman of the Northern Shoshone Band, um, Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. And um, he's also an author and speaker and a lot of you are probably familiar with his work already, um, but he's going to be speaking on an indigenous perspective on climate and the environment 
and he is such a compelling speaker. Um, so I highly recommend um, registering for and attending that event. If you're going to be there in person, please come say hi. Um, I love meeting, you know, members of our uh, organization who I haven't met before and connecting with all of you. Um, so I will be there and um, we'll also be tabling at the event. So for sure, stop by and say hi if you come. Um, the couple of other things I wanted to draw your attention to is MWEG's book group this month is going to be focused on an environment related book. It's this one, All We Can Save. Um, this is such a great little book. It's got a bunch of different essays and poems and um, quotes and data um, from a bunch of different writers. And uh, the book group has made it really easy to get involved this year. You don't have to read the whole thing if you don't want to. There are, or don't have time to. Um, they have picked a few of the essays that are not very long. So it's very easy to just read one or two. Um, and join in, or the book group has also highlighted a few um, online lectures that you can listen to to be prepared. Um, or if you don't have time to do any of those things, you can still come and discuss it with us. The discussion is going to be led by Christy Lehman, who is our environmental specialist for the Utah chapter. Um, and she is just a wealth of knowledge and also has a background in literature and just I can't, I'm really excited. <laughs> She's going to be great. Uh, can't wait to discuss this with her. I actually listened to this book um, on, as an audiobook, uh, probably a year ago, but I loved the poetry in it so much that I bought a hard copy to just have and refer back to. Um, so anyway, it's a very easy, low barrier to entry, interesting and fun um, compilation of just a bunch of different um, writers and topics relating to earth and climate change. So uh, book group for this is going to be the evening of April 13th and the morning of April 14th. Um, so again, uh, leading up to, you could do this with us on <laughs> the end of the week and then come see me at the event on the 15th. Um, we have a lot of content for you <laughs> that week. Um, and then the last thing is, as we traditionally do, we will be um, releasing a call to action around Earth Day. Um, and this year, we're going to be focusing on um, using your efforts in a way that you probably haven't before. So I'm just going to tease that. I'm not going to tell you exactly what we're doing. Um, but it's going to be it's going to be an advocacy ask, but it's going to be um, something something new and something fun and something that you can um, really make an impact in because there aren't that many voices in this space. And um, you can have a specific impact in your state. Uh, it's going to be state-based. We're trying something new. I'm really excited about it. Um, so watch for that around Earth Day. Uh, it'll be open again for a while um, because it's not... Um, so deadline based that it needs to be done like that day, but, um, but it is something that is coming up, something that is important something that you can have an actual real impact because just not that many people do this thing and we're going to teach you how to do it. So, um, that's all I have, Rachel, unless there's something else you would like to talk about, we can talk about, um, some ideas for personal sustainability as well. If you like, we have a couple of minutes. Yeah, I, what, um, I think one of the things that I was thinking of is we have been preparing um, internally at MWAG for some Earth Day things is what are some ideas that other members that you know are doing that you would maybe want to share that, that, um, that are simple, small baby steps for somebody that's like, well, I feel like I'm doing something, but what could I do more that's outside of my regular recycle can to the curb kind of thing, you know, like what, what's something that you would, that you would want to share with our members as, as like baby steps, because I think sometimes it feels really overwhelming or it can be costly. Um, you know, as I was thinking about what, what am I doing or what's important to me or our family, what are we trying to do? And I've been thinking, you know, something that we did is we um, personally have gone solar at our house, it's um, it's it's cost saving to us, but it's also 
you know, something, it's a clean energy that we can do. And um, one of the small things that we've done when we first moved into our home is do like smart thermostats. And we have done a smart um, sprinkler gauge so that when it rains, that's something that's kind of frustrating to me is when it's pouring rain and monsoon in the summer and you see the in public spaces that the sprinklers <laughs> are going and it's just, there's this downpour and there's no reason. And it's just one of those things that it's, it's actually for us in our city, um, our city offered that if you just signed up, you had to go on to a link that our city offered and you basically submitted like a photo of what you already had and where you lived and whatnot. And they gave us, they offered us a free, a new free sprinkler, smart sprinkler box. Um, somebody came out, they installed it, took them about 45 minutes is all because they really just had to unhook some wires and rehook some wires and help me figure out how to hook it to my internet. Um, but I love that um, with that, we are able to do rain delay and things like that, that we're not um, using water outside of what we need to kind of keep the plants in our yard alive. So those are some of the things that we're doing at our house. I just, I don't know what are, were some other so, solutions or suggestions that people had that you might have that's kind of outside of that. Yeah. So you brought up a really great thing to do, right? Which is check with your local government entities. Cause a lot of them do have rebates or promotions, or even just information on how to do some of these things. So where I live, um, I can get a discount on a rain barrel, for example, um, through the Utah Rivers Council. And if you just Google discount rain barrel and your area, you might be able to find something. Um, there, there are some cities in um, the Salt Lake Valley where I live who, who are actually just giving away rain barrels. Mine's not one. I had to pay like 50% of it or something. Um, but that's just something that's available. And these are usually available in the spring. So if you're going to do this, like seize the day, now is the time to do it. Um, find if you can get a rain barrel. We have one, actually love it. It's so awesome. Cause it just like, it's wild to me. We don't get a ton of rain, right? We're not like a rainy place. Um, how quickly it fills up just attached to my rain gutter that comes off my roof, like one good storm. And I've got this huge thing of water for, you know, my house plants or my outside plants or whatever. I want to water with it, right? It's not potable water. I'm not going to drink it unless I'm having like a really dire situation, right? <laughs> it's not a water storage like thing, but it's a, um, how can I, you know, capture some of this land for landscape or some of this water for landscape watering um, that I'd otherwise be using, especially I'm using culinary water, which is what our area has. That's something to check too, is um, look at your landscaping. That's a very easy way to reduce your impact is making sure that your um, plants are suitable for your climate and water levels. Um, and also um, making sure, like you said, you're, if you're using sprinklers that you're um, you know, doing it in a way that's responsible. Um, and if you can afford or find a rebate or get free one of these systems that is more smart and intuitive and adjusts for you or allows you to adjust it easily, um, that helps save water. Um, it's also great to know where your water for your landscape watering is coming from. Um, so if it's culinary water, is this drinking water that we're just pouring you know, by the gallon on our lawns, which is like exactly what's happening here, right? I live in Utah. Um, I have a not huge at all yard, but it's grass. That's the default for the neighborhood, right? We all got grass when we moved in and now we're, we're dumping drinking water in like truly amazing quantities on this grass. Um, so something my husband and I have, we've literally been working on this for like four or five years, um, held up at various stages, but we are, um, we're there escaping our front yard this year, finally um, doing it very piecemeal because of our budget and bandwidth. Um, but I think like people look at these changes that need to be made and it's very easy to get overwhelmed, right? Um, I definitely cannot knock out my whole front yard in a weekend or probably even a month, but it's gonna be like just chipping, chipping away at it. It's what I'm gonna do about my weekends too for the next probably three months to try and get my front yard transitioned out from grass and um, converted over to um, more water friendly, friendly landscaping. Um, 
that's something that a lot of um, places will also offer rebates for. Um, I know in my area, they have a flip your strip program. So your parking strip, that's usually grass between the curb and the sidewalk. Um, you can get rebates for um, switching that out to um, water consumption friendly um, landscaping. Um, and so that's something to look for too. If that's something you're interested in doing, um, look and see if your local government, um, your county or your city, or even like your HOA maybe, um, have some sort of promotion that will help you get that done. Um, it's still expensive. It's still kind of labor intensive, <laughs> like to be honest. Um, but looking at um, our life kind of globally, we decided that's where we would have the most impact is if we stopped pouring water on our front yard. Um, so that's what we're going to do. And I think like, again, it can get very overwhelming. There are lots of things you can do to live more sustainably. So I think it's always best to just kind of look and be like, what's the easiest, what's the lowest hanging fruit. And, and also what will make the most impact and how can I prioritize that? Um, part of my kind of like new year's resolutions, I try and set every year is I try and come up with a goal every month. That's like tiny that will help us live more sustainably and use less. So, um, you know, one month it was like, get water bottles that everyone will use and will be, you know, happy with, um, and transition completely away from, you know, bottled drinks or whatever. Um, we've transitioned away from, um, like, plastic baggies, or, um, we've made kind of an effort actually behind me in this cabinet. Here. <laughs> if you open it, it is full of plastic bags, like Ziploc bags. Check it. This whole cabinet full of Ziploc bags that I got from like stuff I've ordered online that I stash here and reuse when we need a Ziploc bag for something. So now I have like a whole bunch of free bags that otherwise I'd be throwing away. These aren't very recyclable. Um, even if they're sent away to like a recycling facility, we don't really know what, <laughs> whether they were recycled. Usually they aren't, usually they just get dumped off on someone else's their problem. Um, so just reusing stuff that already is coming in your house, like that makes a big impact. Um, there's just so much single use stuff out there. And if we use it more than once, then it's not single use anymore. You've, you've cut your use in half, um, just using something twice. Right. Right. Um, so that's, that's actually, I like that idea of being able to reuse, um, that packaging material. I often feel like really triumphant when I'm like, oh, I have this Amazon stuff and I need to ship something. So I'm going to take the air pockets and I'm going to yeah. reuse those, or I'm going to reuse this box and repurpose it for, for something like that. And those are, those are also like great as you're saying, reuse these bags. Like if you can get two, three uses out of a single bag before, like you said, it's, it may not make it to be able to be recycled, but it's not a single use thing. Um, those, those are some other things. As you were talking about rain barrels, another thing that people can check into that I was thinking about, I know at least in our area, they've offered them in the past. And I know that there's in other states they do is compost bins. So re, you know, yeah. reducing like kitchen food waste um, is yes. are these compost and bins that a lot of times that you can get them for free or, and they're not like the fancy ones you see that turn and whatever, you're gonna have to go out and do some turning yourself. But if you're somebody that's interested in gardening, a compost bin to reduce some of that kitchen waste is great. It's yeah, great and you know what? Um, so I'm like such a comp I'm such a compost evangelist, right? Um, because composting makes such a big difference. And I think people don't realize that when you throw away your kitchen scraps in the garbage, they are like sealed between like plastic and dirt in the landfill and they don't break down like they would if you were just to bury them because land um, landfills are built for storage, not for decomposition. And they're in there with a bunch of other things that are preventing it from um, decomposing naturally. And when they're in a landfill, they actually release a lot of methane and methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, it's much more powerful than carbon, carbon is. It has a shorter half-life um, by quite a lot. So that's 
good, but it's something like, I don't want to quote the wrong thing, but I think it's like 30 times more powerful than carbon dioxide is as a warming agent. So any methane we can keep out of the atmosphere is good. We should absolutely do it. And um, composting can have a much bigger impact really than recycling um, for a lot of items because plastic isn't super recyclable. Um, we, if you're interested in more details on this, we have um, articles in our MWEG library talking about recycling um, and kind of details and well-sourced and it will have the correct statistics unlike my brain right now, maybe. Um, but composting really does have such a big impact. And if it's something you're able to do either in your own yard or contributing to like city compost bins, that's a small way to have a really big impact um, on the sustainability of the way you live. Um, it's something I'm honestly not great at myself um, and something <laughs> This is my big blind spot is we don't have curbside composting and my yard is tiny and I have a hard time like remembering to turn it or whatever. Um, but if you can do it, if you can put your compostables in a curbside compost pickup, if you can um, pay a small fee for a third party to do that for you, if you can, you know, garden, plan on gardening and just have it be part of your routine that you compost stuff and turn it into um you know, rich soil for your own use. That is absolutely something small-ish that makes a really outsized impact compared to the effort you put into it. So absolutely compost if you can. That's a great, a really great way to be more earth friendly. Uh, something I also was thinking about um, earlier as we were uh, talking is, do you have a, a place that you specifically would suggest where people can go and see what their county or what their state is doing or what, uh, maybe not necessarily what they're doing, but what their climate policies are. So there isn't a good database that I'm aware of, um, but usually if you just go to your city, county, or state website, um, states, some of them have climate action plans, but a lot of cities do. And that's why we focus a lot of our work at the um, state and local level is because they're the ones who are really like boots on the ground doing a lot of these things that are going to make a difference in the long run. Um, that's not to say the federal government's not doing anything. We had a couple of big investment bills passed, as most people are aware, in the last year or two um, that have some, you know, exciting priorities and investments. Um, those are great, but it's really the states who are implementing those as well and um, local governments. So if you just go to your city web website, um, a lot of times they will be highlighted right there on the front climate action plan um, or Google climate in your city. And it it's pretty easy to find usually because cities want people to know what they're doing and that they are doing something. If they're not doing something, that's a conversation that's really easy to start. You can email your city council members. You can email your you know, mayor or whoever is the executive of your um, city or local government organization and ask them, you know, do we have an action plan? Um, can you direct me there? Why don't we have one if, you know, if not? Um, and local government officials are usually super receptive to members of their communities reaching out to them, like much more so they have much, you know, smaller constituency than state or especially federal elected officials. Um, these are people who work for you. So, um, they're usually really responsive. They want to hear from you if it's a priority to you and it's not on their radar, they want to know that. So um, that's a really simple way. It takes, you know, 10 minutes. Google your city, see if they have a climate plan. If they don't, email them and ask them, you know, why or where you could find one or how you could help them, you know, get one started. Um, let them know that it's a priority to you. Um, and it's it's really a lot less scary, I think, to talk to local government people because they're like, you like run into them some, right? They're people um, and you're their constituent um, pretty directly. So um, that's a, that's a, I think a <laughs> really easy, quick way to make a difference as well. Well, and I've found, I think, well, this is, this is clearly my opinion, but I feel like it is really, um, environmental things like recycling these, these smaller steps that we can take are a great way to include our kids and to scoop them in and say, okay, we're gonna do this because we wanna breathe cleaner air and we don't want necessarily to have every house in the neighborhood to have plastic grass, you know, or 
those kind of things. And and you see it a lot where we live and it's kind of like, well, like what, I know you have this aesthetic, but then these different things. So it's like, how can we slow things down so that we can enjoy this longer and, and be out and, you know, we're fortunate to live in a place that has access to public spaces and uh, protected lands for, for recreational use. So that's that's great, but I really feel like, as you're saying, it's not as scary if you have some youth, maybe older high school age students that are interested in this, to introduce them to go talk to city council members about it, and and come up with a plan. It's it's such a great introduction into civics and and to um, advocacy work for for younger generations too to get them involved in some of these things. Yeah. And even my, um, my oldest, he's in fifth grade now, but when he was in third grade, he was supposed to write a letter to an elected official or something. It was, it was like his civic, um, assignment for school. And he wrote a letter to our local mayor and was like, Hey, we don't compost. We don't have curbside composting. And that would really like increase the number of people who compost their stuff. So, you know, why don't we have it? And she, uh, frankly was very misinformed. <laughs> And um, we sent her some data and, you know, didn't necessarily follow up because, you know, by then my eight-year-old had kind of like lost interest in it. But he remembers that, right? He's like, oh yeah, I emailed the mayor and she actually had, didn't, she didn't have great information on this. Um, So I gave her some information and maybe that itself didn't result in great change, but I think it was a step, right? She now has access to some better information than she had before. And so next time she's, you know, confronted with this issue or with some data, she has stronger information to rely on. Um, and he absolutely remembers that, you know, it was a couple of years ago and, you know, it was just like a school assignment. It wasn't like a, you know, didn't make a real big deal about it, but, um, yeah, like even littler kids can like have things that are important to them and talk to, um, you know, their local governments about it. They local governments usually are super into that. Like they love kids, <laughs> like <laughs> participating and showing up. They think it's really awesome, even if they don't necessarily, you know, do anything with it. Again, it's just another step. It's just another time to get in front of them and give them better information than they had before. Um, and then it was just, it was a good experience all around. So if you, yeah, if you can find an in for that, or just any concern you're child has encouraged them to, you know, write a letter or an email about it. Um, yeah, that's, it's, it's just such a great way to, to get them involved, um, in, in doing, in doing something and being active and you're right. It, your son remembers it a lot, but it's great to share that information. And, you know, MWAG is a huge supporter of giving our our elected officials as much information so that they can go in informed when they're making, when they're voting, right? Um, for laws and, and different things like that. So um, congratulations to you for doing that and getting that, you know, like you said, it may not have done any immediate change in that exact moment, but next time that comes up, she'll have the information there or we're gonna pass it on or the next people um, and it also teaches them that you go in prepared to share facts, right? And do that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So and also that great. advocacy is a long game. Like we've had some really great successes recently, but like they were a long time coming, right? We worked on Evique May for months and months. We have worked for a couple of years to develop relationships with the ACC. Um, so these aren't... I. I think people get frustrated and I get it completely that, you know, you show up and you do your thing and then like nothing really changes, but it's always a long game. It's always chipping away. It's always incremental. Very rarely do you see big things. And even if big things do happen, you probably aren't seeing all of the tiny things that went on for months and months before that to make the big thing happen. So every little conversation, every time you show up, every time you ask about something, that's a step in the direction we need to be going. Um, so it's just, that's advocacy, right? You just have to that's know that right. it's a long game. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, this, there's a lot to, there's a lot to think about and a lot to um, participate in. There's a lot. I love that we share some information, but we've also given our members some things that they can do, some 
some things they can look forward to as far as book club and, and events and things that we here at MWAG are doing, but also small things they can do on the side that, you know, they may go unnoticed from the people, their neighbors and all of that, but that they can feel good about making little small changes. And then it maybe influences. I found that when I do gardening or if I do outside stuff and I tell people like, oh, it's great. We, we were able to do this and replace this and it saved us some money and it's doing good that I can kind of just share like, this is what we've learned. This has been our experience. And then people can go and look into it, you know, and as we were talking about different, some things definitely cost money, but um, if you have to make replacements, like for us, we had to replace 20 year old air conditioning units that in Arizona, we can't live without that. And they were old and they had lasted a long time. But as we were doing our research, it was what can we do that's the most efficient, but also, you know, is, is going to also be good for energy, that kind of stuff so that they're not running all the time and using a lot of electricity, everything. So just as you think about, as, as people are thinking about, like, I already have to spend the money like as you're talking about your yard and that kind of thing, like if I'm already thinking about making some improvements, how can I include something that's going to not just improve aesthetics of my yard, but maybe the environment and the climate a little bit more. So just some things to think about. So uh, we will make sure that on the MWA calendar of events is the link to sign up for the April, sorry, now the date for, I've got book club, is it the 17th? For, book club is the 13th and 14th. Right. But for the and then uh, the Darren the, Perry 15th. Yes, on the 15th. So uh so go if you want, you can go to the MWID calendar of events that's in the portal. That'll have the link to register there. We'll also put in um the comment section in the discussion group. We'll also put information in the discussion group. Actually, I think it might already be there from Camille about book club. We've again, we've made two different times to fit people's different schedules. One's in the morning one day and one's in the evening um, one of the other days. And the links to that are also in the MY calendar. So look forward to those. It's always a great discussion um, for people to participate. And so it will be, this will be no different. It'll be wonderful. Thank you, Christy, for coming and being part of our grow today. And thank you to those that are watching us today. If you would like to share this information or share this video, you're welcome to do that um, through the YouTube link that will be posted in the discussion group. And we will be um, back next week with some chapter updates, uh, aside from some of the, the climate stuff that we've been working on, um, our chapter directors will be with us next week, just giving some updates on our chapters and what they're doing. So if you're interested in learning more about the chapter in your area or where we may have chapters, um, join us for the Grove next week and we'll talk about that. So thanks for being here. We'll talk to you later.